Welcome to Trial Lawyer View, a podcast for and about trial lawyers. We will tell the stories about trial lawyers go to battle every day in courtrooms throughout the United States for injury victims. This is about their stories and their practices. Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Lazarus, your host for Trial Lawyer View. Thank you for tuning in today for another episode. Trial Lawyer View is brought to you by Synergy Settlement Services. In full disclosure, I'm not a professional podcaster. Instead, my day job is Chief Executive Officer of Synergy Settlement Services. Synergy allows trial lawyers to focus on what they do best by handling the difficult issues that arise at settlement, like troublesome lien resolution issues, Medicare secondary payer compliance, government benefit preservation techniques, and complex settlement planning. Joining me today on Trial Law Review is Tony Romanucci. He is a hard-nosed litigator and incredibly successful trial lawyer. Tony is a founding partner in the Chicago-based law firm of Romanucci & Blandin. His practice focuses on fighting for victims of negligence, abuse, and wrongful death arising from police misconduct, corporate negligence, civil rights actions, medical malpractice, mass torts, and class actions. I'm going to read a little bit about Tony's bio. Uh, To do it real justice, it would take the rest of this podcast, so I'm just going to hit the highlights. Tony served alongside lead counsel Ben Crump as co-counsel representing the family of George Floyd in the landmark Minneapolis police misconduct case. He has a steadfast commitment to fighting for those seeking justice across the country in complex high-profile mass tort cases such as the fight against e-cigarette manufacturer Juul, Boeing for its faulty 737 MAX aircraft, the carcinogenic environmental pollution caused by by sterogenics, and in the MGM Las Vegas shooting. He has taken a lead role in national cases related to COVID-19 business interruption on behalf of restaurants, retail companies, and the service industry in a quest to hold insurance companies responsible for their contractual payment to their customers. The firm has obtained multiple verdicts and settlements in the millions of dollars in cases, including a record-breaking $44.7 million verdict on behalf of a young man left bound to a wheelchair and with permanent brain damage following a gunshot wound to the head. I could go on about the incredible verdicts, but again, we only have 45 minutes today. Tony has been widely recognized for his insight and experience and is named a top 100 super lawyer for 12 straight years in Illinois, top 10 leading plaintiff lawyer in Illinois for 2019 by leading lawyers, and was named a best lawyer for 2013 through 2021 by US News and World Report. He maintains a perfect Martindale Hubble AV rating and an AVO rating of 10 out of 10. He was recently selected by his peers for inclusion in the 2020 edition of the best lawyers in America. Often called upon as an expert, Tony appears regularly on local and national television to comment on his own cases, as well as other high-profile legal matters and trends. He's appeared on almost every major network as a legal expert. He has so many awards and recognition. You'll have to visit his website at rblaw.net to read about it all. Tony received his BA in psychology from the University of Wisconsin, like me. That was my undergraduate degree. And his JD from UIC John Marshall Law School. Tony, welcome to Trial Lawyer Review. Thank you for joining me today. Love that we get this opportunity to chat. Thanks so much, Jason. And it's always just so great to interact with another Badger. It really is. So um, before we talk about all the law stuff, um, I, I know that you're very proud of your Italian heritage. Why is that so important to you? Well, my heritage is important to me for a number of reasons, Jason. You know, my my parents have the typical story that you've heard probably thousands of times. You know, they emigrated from Italy to the United States and they didn't have much with them when they came over here. And so they had to work from the ground up. And, you know, they just taught me to have a really good work ethic. And they might have taught me a little bit too well uh, because, you know, work really is my passion. Um, I don't want to say it's my life because I adore my family. I do like uh, a little bit of downtime here and then, um, but but work is what it really is all about for me. And and I say this wholeheartedly and, and, and so sincerely is that, you know, the best part of my day every day 
um, is when I come to the office. I love being here. I, I love being a part of the work and the excitement uh, that we do in this office, the work that we do. Uh, I can understand that completely. Uh, my, my parents were entrepreneurs and it burned into me that work ethic, seeing them build a business from basically zero to, to very successful uh, operations. So, and, and I, I really enjoy that part of what I do, being part of that, that entrepreneurial spirit and seeing good that we do every day, like you guys get to do with clients, being part of a solution that helps improve people's lives is, is really kind of cool to be able to do both those things simultaneously. You know, there, there's one more thing about that, Jason. You know, you just reminded me with what your with what your family did. My my parents <clears throat> became successful restaurateurs, and and when I say successful, they 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 earned a nice living. But we had to work hard. And, and as a teenager and as a young adult, um, there isn't one thing that I didn't do in that restaurant except cook, because that was they knew better than to put me behind the line cooking. But there wasn't one thing that I didn't do in that restaurant: bartend bus tables, host, wait tables, uh, make the pizzas, um, clean, wash, wash and clean dishes, mop the floors. And, and so that certainly gave me another taste for what it takes in order to run a business. And a law firm is a business. And I will tell you that if the receptionist is out tomorrow and there's nobody to answer phones, I will go and answer phones because I know how to do it. Yeah, it's funny you say that. So my, my family owned a printing business and I did everything except run a printing press in there. So I, I get that. Actually, it took a year in between undergrad and going to law school and worked for them because I felt like, you know, I, I needed a little bit of break before I went to law school. And uh, that that definitely drove me to go to law school because it wasn't my passion being in, in that business. But you know, doing every little thing from working photocopiers to assembling booklets to operating computers to going out and delivering boxes of printed material to customers, it, it does give you an appreciation for, for that kind of effort that it takes. So um, in doing my research about you, uh, and this just jumped off, jumped off the page to me. It was funny. I read that you're bad at chemistry. So instead you decided to go to law school over medical school. Uh, what is at the heart of your passion for being a trial lawyer? So I, I, I need to explain that. First of all, you're right. I, I was horrible at chemistry. Okay. So that let's just get that off the table now. But, but what I, what I, the, the story behind being bad at chemistry, um, which, which is the truth is really my goal, even when I was young, knowing that I wanted to be a professional. And medicine was certainly something that appealed to me when I was, you know, 13, 14 years old. And I thought, and I knew that if I wanted to, you know, go into medicine, that I had to understand the sciences. So when, 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 I, when I found out that, that my skill set was not in, in molecular biology or in chemistry, well, I, I transitioned um, to staying a professional. And, and that's when I realized, especially when, when, I, when I got into debate in high school, that, wow, maybe law is something that I can do because I was kind of, you know, shy. I was a teenager. I, I didn't like to speak in front of crowds or people, uh, but debate really helped me a lot. My high school teacher was very instrumental in, in recognizing that I did have something within me that um, probably could be something that I, he saw in my future. And, and that's when I decided, along with the help from my father, who was you know, very, very helpful in, in pushing me towards you know, being a profession and recognizing that law would be the right one. So no, you ultimately went to law school and when you were in law school, you got the opportunity to work in the Cook County Defender's Office. How did that experience set you on a path of handling police misconduct cases? Well, Jason, you know, sometimes, you know, the Cook County Public Defender's Office could be, you know, a podcast in and all of, it, of itself because, you know, for, for those of us who are old enough or remember, there used to be a show called Night Court. And, you know, it was um, 
a sitcom and it had a laugh track and it was meant to be funny. Um, but if you really peel back the layers on that show, there was, you know, a, a, a very macabre, sad uh, undertone of what life was like uh, in a big city um, in a high volume courtroom. And so why don't you take that night court and bring it to day court, which is when I worked, was during the day, into a very high volume courtroom uh, that overlooked uh, the L tracks here in Chicago, where there was no air conditioning in those courtrooms and the windows had to be opened. And every several minutes you had to pause if you're in front of the judge because the L tracks would make so much noise that you couldn't hear what anybody was saying. The other part of, you know, being part of the Cook County Public Defender, which stands out because it's really important to the listener to have a picture of, of where I was, really closing your eyes and drawing that mental picture of not only the courtroom that I was in, but the people that I was dealing with. You know, every day I would have to go home and clean my shoes uh, because there would be white powder on my shoes from, you know, the rat poison that had to be uh, uh, spilled into the courtroom overnight in order to take care of the rodents. And I, I didn't want to track any of that into the home. Every morning, my job was to uh, go into what's called the bullpen. You know, the sheriff would unlock the jail door, and it was my job to sit in a room, uh, a very smelly, dirty, uh, dark, damp uh, room with 20 to 30 to maybe even 40 overnight prisoners and do what's called interviews for their bond hearings. And that was my first job was getting out, was getting people out on reasonable bond or what's called I bond, an individual bond, uh, re released on their own recognizance. And, and when you can picture this, this high volume, noisy, uh, hot, uh, not very good smelling courtroom with um, overnight detainees that were charged with crimes such as uh, uh, either burglaries, uh, unlawful use of weapon, retail theft. And we had a courtroom in that building called the Women's Court at the time. And that was the courtroom for women who were uh, arrested for a prostitution. And those were the four courtrooms that I would bounce in between on a daily basis, depending on where they needed me. And, and that gives you a little bit of a sense of, of how I started out in the public defender's office. Now, maybe you're going to ask me a question, but I'm going to ask the question myself and I'll answer it um, about what was it about the PD's office that set me on this course? And I don't know if you want to ask me something in between or not, uh, but that's really the, the important part of, of this story about the public defender's office. Because one of the courtrooms that I worked at, Jason, was called gun court. And that's what it was. There were people who were arrested for unlawful use of weapon. And at that time, if you possessed the weapon but didn't shoot it at somebody, you would come into my courtroom. If you shot the gun, it would go into a different courtroom. So I was defending people who were in possession of guns unlawfully. And here's what I learned. And I'm just going to say it bluntly, and this will upset some of your viewers, and some of your viewers will agree with me. And that is that police officers will lie in order to justify an arrest. What happened was that I would handle on a daily basis, sometimes dozens of these unlawful use of weapons charges. And over time, you saw the same pattern of narrative in the arrest reports, right? The arrest report would say that, you know, um, suspicious individual walking down the street with the butt of a gun sticking out from underneath his waistband. Well, I can tell you, I've been walking the streets of Chicago for a long, long time. Too many years to even tell you. And maybe I don't walk the right neighborhoods all the time, but I've never seen anybody walking with the butt of a gun sticking out from underneath their waistband. But what does that do? 
it's a justifiable stop under the Fourth Amendment. If we remember Terry v. Ohio, you know, you need a reasonable, articulable suspicion in order to make a street stop. Well, the butt of a gun, right, gets you around that articulable suspicion because it's plain view. So plain view is an exception to the Fourth Amendment. So the reality is that if the individual did have a gun on his person, it was probably secreted. It was hidden from view, but police officers would make street stops in order to gain possession of illegal guns. And well, there's one side of the population that, that says, well, that's good. That's really good. Get guns off the street. You know what? From a moral standpoint, I agree. However, from a constitutional standpoint, that's when things um, can slide into a slippery slope and we wind up in anarchy if everybody on the street can be stopped without basis and then arrested. Sorry for the long answer, but very, very um, instrumental, very, um, you know, lessons that I learned that will stay with me forever. And it's the same thing with drug cases. Drug cases are the same. There would be a stop with a vehicle and the officer would say that he spotted the baggie sticking out from underneath the front seat of a car. Okay. No, that's perfect. You know, that's sort of what I was getting at. And, you know, I, I guess in follow-up to that, are things changing for the worst or have they gotten any better or do you think it's similar? I mean, I, I wanted to ask you some questions in follow-up about some of the other cases you've been involved with that, yeah. um, you know, but clearly it seems as though we keep seeing these high profile cases that um, seem to indicate that we still have plenty of work to do to, to make this a lot better. Well, that, that's, that's a really good question because there are two points to that question, Jason. Number one, and I'll start with the most recent and then go back in time. Number one, we have learned that low level stops, whether they are low level uh, street stops or low level driving stops lead to, can lead to disastrous results. You look at the Dante Wright case in, in uh, Brooklyn Center, uh, Minnesota. This is, a, this is an 18 year old kid who was driving with expired tags. He was pulled over and within a minute, um, he was shot and, and killed. Now the officer mistook her, her, her gun for a taser and thought she was tasing him, but instead she killed him. And this is over expired tags. Um, in Las Vegas, Nevada, um, Byron Williams was riding his bicycle um, and his headlight wasn't operating correctly. And the Las Vegas Metro chased him. And once he, they caught up to him, he ran from them. And when they caught up with him, uh, they restrained him and, and he was dead within five minutes. So the low level stops have extreme probability of, of ending up in results that are not optimal. And here in Chicago, um, there's a lawsuit on file that our office has filed. Um, and we, we refer to it as the stop and frisk litigation. Um, and, and the reason it's called that is because from 2011 to 2015, Chicago police made about approximately, give or take a couple hundred thousand, about two million documented street stops. In other words, if they stop somebody on the street, they filled out what's called a contact card. Then that contact card, it had that person's name, their address, um, how old they are, what their race, their gender, and why they were stopped. It was always the same articulation, you know, suspicious, hand-to-hand -hand exchange. But don't forget, these two million stops did not involve an arrest, right? These are two million people who were stopped without being arrested. So every articulable statement that was made by the police was wrong. Out of two million stops, they were wrong two million times. So why is that significant? 
Well, because 72% of the people who were stopped were black. And in Chicago, they make up 28% of the population. And the other 28% were, were a mixture of Latino, Asian, and white. And so that's what we're saying is that this, it's a racial issue as opposed to a crime issue. Uh, and it's understandable why people of color flee in those circumstances, because look at what the outcomes are. I mean, it, it's, it seems like it's just a vicious cycle that doesn't want to end, unfortunately. Well, thank you for recognizing that. You don't know how many times people ask me, well, they shouldn't have run. Had they not run from the police, they would have been fine. Well, here, here's, here's, here's the, the short answer, because this is such a sociographic discussion, right? Is that there has been a culture of this type of behavior between police and communities of color not not for years, but but you know, well over a century, if not greater. I can't even tell you how many years, but certainly for probably a century and a half. So the behavior is learned behavior. And the learned behavior is that if you're getting chased by a white police officer who likely has a gun with him, that you have a chance of dying in his custody or dying before you're in custody because of that fear. So the answer to, as to why do black people run? Because it's learned behavior because of the constitutional violations that they've been handed for century and a half. So I, I understand from the research I did that you formed the police misconduct litigation group, which was created after Michael Brown was fatally shot by a police officer in Ferguson. Missouri, and it's now part of AAJ. What is that group's mission and why is that important to you? And, and just the importance of groups like the AAJ and this group in particular in general, what, why, why are those things so important? Well, first of all, I can't say enough about AAJ, you know, the American Association for Justice. This, is, this podcast is not a plug for them, but, but if there's any organization in this country that is there to literally serve and protect the rights of injured people and victims of misconduct or people who have been aggrieved of the law, well, it's AAJ. And so I'm a member of AAJ and I'm a deep believer in AAJ because I'm part of that mission. I want to be a part of the solution to be able to solve some of these problems that we have. And so you know, besides being a member of my own association, Jason, which is called the Whatever It Takes Movement, um, I think I have about three or four members right now. Uh, maybe you might want to join too. Um, you can be number five. I'm there, but but I do. I, I I'm I'm like a member of this of my own association where I call myself the Whatever It Takes Movement. So I always ask myself, what is it that I can do to make something better? So after Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, I, you know, being a member of AAJ, something hit me there. Just something just struck me that I felt that that shooting, it was a turning point. There was something there that I can't explain, but it bothered me so much. So what I recognized is that AAJ did not have literally a police misconduct litigation group. And so once I was able to form that organization within AAJ, the purpose behind it was to bring lawyers of like mind across the country who were members of AAJ to serve police misconduct as almost one huge, big law firm. Why shouldn't we be connected on issues that we care about? And so police misconduct litigation was born um, in October of 2014, uh, and Michael Brown was killed in August of 2014. And, and shortly thereafter, um, AAJ accepted uh, PMLG as, as a litigation group. And so, you know, and that's how I feel that we have lawyers from California to New York, down to Florida, up to Illinois, and even Minnesota, um, 
where where we can collaborate, corroborate, and and use each other as resources in order to help our clients against police misconduct. Yeah, and, and you know, being a part of AAJ myself, being a member and being a member of the Florida Justice Association and seeing how those organizations are able to support their membership in terms of basically becoming one big law firm when someone needs help, you know, particularly when you're facing the government in these types of complex misconduct cases, seems like a very useful and important piece that AAJ was missing until that group was formed. Well, that that's a really good way to look at it. You know, a, a, if, if AAJ is the big law firm where everybody practices together, then police misconduct is like the, the practice group within AAJ that concentrates on those cases. And, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of police misconduct because, you know, we bring in national speakers, uh, experts to talk about, you know, new trends and new tactics, uh, you know, new ways of looking at cases. And, and you know, it, it's, it's true. You know, the, the part of the goal is to put ourselves out of business, right? We don't want police misconduct. We want people's rights to be protected. And if there's another area of law that we can pursue or we can be helpful, well, then we'll do that. But in the meantime, we've seen too many people being killed completely unnecessarily, uh, either because of bad police training or because of systemic racial issues that exist. So you've got this long history of, of handling police misconduct cases and forming the group that we just talked about. And then George Floyd is, is killed by the police in Minnesota, which gives you an opportunity to work with Ben Crump, who I, I went to law school with at, at Florida State University College of Law. Um, and by the way, I got my undergraduate degree from Central Florida, but it was in psychology. So I'm not a fellow Badger, uh, unfortunately. Uh, didn't get out of Florida for school, but... but um, but the, the George Floyd case is just chilling and disturbing. Watching that video is, is something you can never unsee. And the, the case gripped the entire country, which ultimately led to both civil and criminal cases. Can you talk about what your involvement in that case um, was and how, you know, what it's meant to you, how it's changed your life? Yeah, there, there's no doubt that that George Floyd has changed my life. Um, you know, I'm very grateful to to Ben Crump himself for, you know, bringing me into the case and 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 having me be his lead trial counsel uh, on that case. I, I think the world of Ben, he's just a a genius communicator, uh, one that I, I I could never be the the person that he is in in terms of communicating. But, but it has changed my life, Jason. It, it really has. Um, and you're right. I remember exactly the moment where I was when I watched that video uh, before I was involved in the case. And I said to myself, oh, my God, this case will change the world. I knew it. I just I, at that point, you know, Michael Brown was one watershed moment for me and then everything in between yeah we know there were a lot of you know bad unnecessary killings but with George Floyd I knew that case would change the world and uh, it's just believe it or not within six hours of me watching that video Ben had called to say Tony will you join me on this and what we did you know as a team you know with the Crump firm and, and my firm we knew that because this case was going to change the world, uh, we couldn't treat this case as, as, if, as if it was any other case. So we, we ripped up, we completely ripped up any rule book, playbook, strategy, anything that had been done on any prior you know, case of this nature or magnitude, and we rewrote a new one. Uh, we started uh, right away with things that you would do almost backwards. You know, we started with this case like at trial. I can tell you that within about two to three weeks of us being retained on this case, we had a pretty good shot of being able to try the case without any discovery. Um, we had at that point and got 
so many thanks to the team members who worked absolute, uh, just incredible hours, 18, 19, 20 hours a day for those first several weeks, putting everything together that we needed to, because we knew, we knew where we were going, what our theories were, how we were going to win that case, not just for the Floyd family, but to change the world. And regrettably, um, we did win the case for the Floyd family, but we have yet to change the world. And, and that's because the, the Senate still hasn't passed on the George Floyd Police Reform Act, right? The one that Congress passed in March, we are still waiting its passage. So um, Ben and I have been working feverishly lobbying Washington, D.C., the senators, uh, making multiple trips there, at least one or two per month, uh, meeting with anybody and everybody that will listen to us so that we can do whatever it takes in order to make the difference. Um, we, there's been a lot of local successes, though. It, it's not been a, a failure. Um, so many states have enacted uh, their own laws in the wake of George Floyd. Many municipalities, local municipalities, have banned chokeholds. Um, restraints have not been banned, but, but certainly chokeholds have. Um, you know, Colorado has eliminated qualified immunity. Uh, Illinois is considering it, but, but don't know that that will happen. Um, so there have been micro successes across the country, but we need Congress to act. That's more important, Jason. Yeah, it uh, seems like it's still a, a long uphill battle. I'd, I'd hope there'd be change quicker after that kind of a thing. But, you know, of course, when you're talking about change that has to happen through the government, it, it becomes certainly a much more drawn out and long process. So I, I saw a quote about one of your guiding principles that you work to ensure equality for people, that everyone deserves a chance to be treated fairly. And you see yourself as a fighter for social justice. I mean, I think you've talked about some of that already, but um, can you relate that to what you do for clients day in, day out? I know, you know, not all of your cases are police misconduct, and certainly there's a lot of cases where, you know, that, that applies just as equally to that. Yeah, I, I want to bring this back just for a moment to the Floyd family. Because when you talk about fighting for social justice, equal rights, um, you know, all men created equal, um, as our forefathers had stated, I, I really learned, you know, even at my age, Jason, you know, I learned such a great lesson uh, being embedded uh, with the Floyd family for a good part of a year. And, and I mean, I was with them a lot. I mean, we traveled all over the country. Uh, I can't even, can't even name how many states or cities we've been in together. Certainly, we spent the most time together in Minneapolis in the state of Minnesota. But being embedded with them and watching them suffer through what George went through, watching the realization of what happened to their loved one, having to watch them relive this, having watched them actually fight so hard for other families who had gone through similar circumstances, whether it was Breonna Taylor or Byron Williams or Andre Hill or, or Daniel Prude or Javier Ambler, and the names go on and on and on. The Floyd family fought not only for George, but to ensure justice is equal for all. And so when, when I say that I learned a lesson, it's like I, I probably was reinforced with the lessons that I already knew. And that was that we indeed, all men are created equal, right? When, when you peel us back, when you peel back the color of our skin, well, we're all built the same. We all have the same musculature. Uh, they're all named the same. We have the same beating heart, the same red blood that courses through our brain, uh, our, our veins, the same brain, right? Bones, everything's the same except the color of our skin. But then again, you know, some people have, have grown up and learned that people of color, especially blacks, well, they're dangerous. 
and 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 police have learned to shoot or cause harm before they actually find the truth whereas very likely you or i in those same circumstances we, we'd be alive but let's let's just call the truth what it is we we probably would not have suffered the same fate that george suffered even had we been a little high on fentanyl okay you know we need to recognize that 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 drugs and their overuse are a disease and not really a choice sometimes and and so you know just because you're a little bit high and maybe acting not completely rationally well that's not a death sentence so yes i represent many more people other than those that have been um, involved in, in police related matters uh, i represent many many people who are harmed by large super large fortune 500 fortune 100 corporations and environmental litigation um, though those people those victims are are just as aggrieved as those who are the, the ones killed by police except the ones that are killed by police make the news every day uh, the ones who are harmed hundreds at a time by by dows or monsantos or by Paraquat, well, you don't hear about that in the news every day. It's, um, you know, unfortunately, there's a variety of different ways that people are wronged. And, you know, there's not enough recognition for lawyers out there like you who are doing what they do day in, day out to make sure that people are protected. I, I think the the practice is completely undervalued by most people because they don't really understand how important this is until they become a victim or someone in their family becomes a victim. And then they gain the understanding of why it becomes crucial to have people like you that will go out and fight for what is right. I, I, I agree. I agree. You know, I, you know, the Dante Wright family, you know, they're, they're just 10 miles away from where George Floyd was killed. And we now represent that family. And, you know, when you hear their story of how they, they suffered watching what George Floyd, what, what he went through and what the Floyd family went through. And they'll, and they'll tell you how they grieved for the Floyd family and how they could never, ever have imagined that less than a year later, they would be a footnote to George Floyd that Dante Wright, their son, their 18 year old son was killed. It's just unbelievable. Well, you, you've achieved some incredible results in a lot of different cases. And I wanted to ask you about some of the more important things you've accomplished through cases you've handled. I, I read online that one of your proudest achievements was related to aluminum bat manufacturing processes and practices. And, and I, yeah. I wanted to talk about that because I just found that very interesting and thought it would be a, a good thing to to talk about. Yeah. So th there, there's this there's this concept that used to exist with with metal bats. Uh, they were mostly made out of aluminum, and then they were made out of composites. And especially when they were when they became composite, what they were able to do with these composite bats is they made them into three parts. They made them into the handle, which was one part, the joinder, which was the part that joined the handle and the barrel, and then the barrel of the bat. And so this 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 this, this joinder between the barrel and the uh, barrel of the bat would act as almost like a fulcrum um, for the bat, so that if you had a good swinging kid and and a fast enough ball hit at him, um, a composite bat, depending on its rating. And these bats, usually a good bat back then had a rating of minus seven, eight or nine, um, a good swing. Um, and you'd hear that familiar ding and that ball would go a long, long way. Well, what happened was, is that especially in little league games, as opposed to older age children's groups, when you had that, that um, awkward age of 10, 11, 12, where you could have undersized or oversized kids, you know, for their age. And so let's just take the age of 10. So let's say you have an undersized pitcher 
facing an oversized batter with a really good bat in his hands. And you're 42 feet away, and this undersized pitcher throws a fastball, as fast as a fastball as a 10-year-old could throw. And this 10-year-old at the bat takes the big swing, and this composite bat hits the ball right back at the pitcher's head, and there's no, uh, there's no time, right? There's no perception reaction time for this pitcher to hold his glove up to protect either his head or catch the ball. And what happens is very disastrous, very disastrous. You get balls that, are, that bounce off of children's heads and we're causing death um, or, or paralysis or, or very serious brain injuries. And there, was, there were a series of these events happening across the country. And one of them happened here locally. And I got involved in the case and we sued the bat manufacturer, as did two other families across the country, one in New Jersey and one, I believe, was in Montana. Um, and those three cases were really the, the pivot point where Little League Baseball of America changed the rules as to how bats could behave. And they changed the rules so that all metal and composite bats have to behave like wood bats, which that's how I grew up was with a wood bat. And, and a wood bat behaves at, um, at, a, at a zero rating. It's not a minus eight, a minus seven, or even a minus one. A wood bat is, is, is static. It's at a zero. And I, I dare you to count how many kids have been hit in the head by baseballs uh, where they've suffered injury in the past 10 years. You, you wouldn't be able to probably count five that have made the news, and that's a great thing. Yeah, that's an incredible thing to make sure that those kids are protected. Uh, the the case, and, and I, I don't want to butcher the last name, I think it's Carrion. Um, Carrion, yeah. Um, Cut it. Cut it. $19 million settlement for a family that was devastated by a Chicago police chase can you talk about that case and, and what the end result uh, was for that family, how that helped them get through that? Yeah. So if you remember, we talked earlier about how low level stops and, and low level street and police stops lead to disastrous results. Well, in this case, the Chicago Police Department's general orders prohibit the pursuit of any vehicle that is involved in a property crime. And that's because we, as a community, as a country, we value the life of people over the value of property. And so in this instance, there were a few, a few kids who were joyriding in a stolen car. They had not stolen the car, but nonetheless, I am not condoning that they were joyriding in a stolen car. The Chicago police identified it as a stolen car and engaged a pursuit, a high-speed police pursuit in an urban setting in Chicago, Illinois, where there were stoplights and, and, and stop signs. And there were violations of those stoplights and, and, and stop signs. And the general orders required that once there is a, a violation of one of those by the, by the bullet vehicle, you are to terminate your pursuit. And the police never terminated the pursuit, despite the fact that they probably never should have started the pursuit and that bullet vehicle uh, T-boned uh, the car where my clients were, were riding in. And Maria Carrion uh, was killed. She was the mother of four children. Uh, there were five of her family members were also in the car. They were all seriously hurt. And it was a, a, a disastrous case. It resulted in a $21 million uh, verdict on behalf of the family. Uh, which was, at least in this jurisdiction, a, a record verdict for a police pursuit. And when the case was up on appeal, uh, the family accepted a settlement uh, in excess of $19 million in order to end the litigation and so, so that they could move on with their life. But those are the dangers of, of police pursuits, which are inherently dangerous uh, because police pursuits typically end up badly. They, they don't end up uh, like you see in the movies all the time. Uh, they end up with somebody innocent being killed. 
another case was the Laporta case, which is, I think, a Section 1983 case from what I, I read, which resulted in a, a $44 million verdict uh, for a victim that was shot by an off-duty Chicago police officer, which caused severe brain injuries. Um, and I understand the verdict's been appealed and it's ultimately going before the U.S. Supreme Court um, this fall. Can you talk about that case? Yes. Um, you know, Mikey Laporta uh, was a young man with his full life ahead of him. He was 29 years old. He and his best friend, who was an off-duty police officer, were, were out drinking one night. And uh, something bad happened at uh, this off-duty police officer's house. But the story really begins six years before the bad thing happened in the house, because when Patrick Kelly became a police officer, uh, the Chicago Police Department gave him a gun, a badge, and a shield. And Patrick Kelly became kind of like a wrecking ball, so to speak, as a Chicago police officer. He accumulated uh, 19 civilian complaints in less than uh, basically about five and a half years. Many of them were off-duty complaints that, in, that involved violence, uh, domestic violence, drinking, uh, on-duty complaints of, of violence, racial slurs, uh, racial slurs, excuse me. Um, so he was kind of like a mess. And and the Chicago Police Department had numerous opportunities to fire, terminate Patrick Kelly for cause on many occasions and take away his FOID card, take away his ability to own a gun, have a gun, and, and have bullets in his gun. Instead, they found ways, they found affirmative ways to keep him on the job because Patrick Kelly was a clouded police officer. And so he kept his job. And because he was able to keep his job on so many occasions, Patrick Kelly knew that if he could commit misconduct, that he would get away with it. And so when he and Mikey Laporta were in his house one night drinking and they got in a fight, Patrick Kelly took his gun out and shot Mikey in the head. Because that's how you settle fights. That's how you settle disputes between two good buddies, right? You shoot him in the head. And so that's where the cover-up began. The cover-up began um, instantly when Patrick Kelly called 911 and said that his best friend had just committed suicide. Um, indeed, he didn't know that Mikey Laporta uh, was breathing. He thought that he had killed him. And so when 911 arrived and, and they saw that Mike, Mikey Laporta was alive, uh, the cover-up uh, began to fail and unravel. So the police department then got involved and what they did is they conducted no investigation in order to assist Patrick Kelly's initial call of a suicide. To make a long story short, Jason, the case went to trial and we had to prove that Patrick Kelly shot Mikey Laporta. The jury agreed. Uh, they signed a special interrogatory that Patrick Kelly indeed did shoot Mikey Laporta. We had all the evidence that showed that it did. After the verdict and the case went up on appeal, the city of Chicago thought better about at least part of their appeal, and they now admit that Patrick Kelly did shoot Mikey Laporta, although they disputed it and defended the case for eight years, saying that he didn't. Now the city of Chicago says that he did. And so the case is on appeal on a legal issue, uh, which is a bit complicated, um, but uh, the case is on appeal, not as a result of the award or the, the judgment or the finding, but on a legal issue right now. But I assume that's tough on the Laporta family uh, without having the money yeah. that could help take care of him. Oh, tragic. Just tragic. Uh, so the last uh, case I want to talk to you about, uh, your lead counsel for firms pursuing justice for those exposed to ethylene oxide near Stereogenics International in Willowbrook, Illinois. Can you talk about that case and what you've been uh, trying to prove on behalf of those clients? Sure, sure. So way, way back about 80, 90 years ago, um, this company, uh, Griffith, uh, figured out that this chemical that's out there, it's called ethylene oxide. It's also known as ETO that it's really, really good at killing things. It's especially good at killing fungus, microbes, bacteria, viruses. And so ethylene oxide uh, began uh, 
you know, decades ago, they began to use it to uh, sterilize, believe it or not, spices. Um, they would sterilize spices with ethylene oxide. And that's how we would get, you know, um, food that wasn't contaminated with those things that I, I just mentioned. Well, eventually, um, you know, the chemical industry learned that, well, ETO is so good at killing things that they began to use it as a sterilizer for medical equipment. And it is such an effective killer of virus and bacteria and microbes and fungus is because what it does is ethylene oxide actually changes the DNA structure of the cell that it's attacking. So when it alters the DNA cell, it effectively kills it. Well, as you can imagine, ETO, if not controlled, uh, which by the way, has been determined to be the second most carcinogenic chemical or cancer causing agent other than radiation. So number one, too many x-rays. Number two, almost any ingestion of ETO will kill you or at least cause cancer. And so there was this medical sterilization company in Willowbrook, Illinois, called the Sterogenics Company, Sterogenics Inc. And they have plants across the country, New Mexico, Colorado, Georgia. And they sterilize medical equipment. They sterilize lots of medical equipment. But they sterilize this medical equipment without very good controls on their back vents, on their fugitive emissions, on their stack emissions, on the height of their stacks. And over the course of decades, uh, they were polluting and, and killing and causing cancer in this densely populated area of, suburb, of suburban Chicago. And currently there are about 800 cases of people who are claiming cancer as a result of their inhalation of emissions of this deadly chemical from sterogenics over the course of decades. So I, I know that uh, you've built this incredibly successful law practice. You, your firm's mission is to help those uh, who have been injured and suffered life-changing and emotional injuries due to the wrongful actions of, of many different actors. Um, and, and I wanted to ask you if there was one tip in particular you would give to other trialers that's part of your secret to success in building your practice. Well, you know, that, that, that's a good one, Jason. I don't know if there's one secret, but I, what I can tell you what I, what I preach and what I talk to my lawyers about constantly. And I don't know if that's the secret to success, but I'm going to say at least for, for me, it's worked for our firm, it's worked. And that is that we always talk about the client first. Um, if we talk about the client first, if we talk about helping our client first, if we talk about having a love for our client and what we do, the rest will follow. So if I have a lawyer in my firm that talks about money first, I ask them to leave. It's plain and simple. I, I probably will tell them that this is not a good place for you um, because if we take care of the client first, then the rest will follow. Um, I don't hide or shy away from the fact that, you know, we are a business. Uh, we need to make money in order to make payroll and have our office and pay rent and order copy paper and pay benefits. Yes, we have to do that, but we do it with a, with a mission in mind, even if it makes, even if it means making less money uh, than other firms, we want to take care of the client first and that's what we do. Well, I can tell you we're, we're 100% aligned with that concept. We, have every month our all hands meeting a discussion about our mission of improving lives and we go through examples of how we've made a difference through the services that we provide to those clients and emphasize the opportunity that we get and the privilege of serving those people to make sure that they are ultimately better off from having had interaction with our company yes we are business just like you and we have to be mindful of, of that, but at the core of it, we want people that care deeply about that mission and hopefully have some empathy and can understand 
that people that wind up needing our assistance have been through something pretty tragic and horrific, horrific, generally speaking. And so, you know, that, that is what the focus should always be is, is on that. So I think that's, that's an excellent suggestion of, of a starting point for the success. And it, it kind of leads me into the next question I was going to ask you, which I, I typically ask everybody that appears on the podcast is that this idea of empathy and how do you connect emotionally with what a client has been through so that you can adequately convey that to a jury or are there top three things that you could outline that you do to help you do that when it comes time to face the jury? Well, yeah, that, that, that's a loaded question, but, but what comes to mind is a, is a quick story. We represented the Tinman family about 10 years ago in a medical malpractice case that involved their, their son and some, some horrors that he went through as a young child. And, and, if Pam Tinman were here, if Jake's mom was here, she would tell you that um, 15 lawyers turned down their case before they wound up on us. She wouldn't give up. And, um, you know, we were younger. We were a smaller firm, and we decided that we could help this family. And we didn't know whether we could or not, but we took a chance. And we did. And when it came time for trial, because they weren't settling the case with us, um, when it came time for trial, you know, I, it was my job, my responsibility to figure out a way to portray the damages in this case, uh, because Jake was, was severely disabled. Um, he was uh, not only physically injured, but, but cognitively he had suffered as a result of the anoxia that he had gone through. So he had uh, very, very um, severe permanent and physical impairments, uh, cognitive impairments. So we figured out a way that in order for me to portray the damages appropriately at trial, I had to become Jake's best friend. And so Jake was about maybe nine or 10 years old at the time of trial. So I spent about three months uh, before trial becoming Jake's best friend. And what I mean by that, I'd go over to his house and I'd participate in playtime. He'd come over to my office and we'd, we'd play so that Jake would be, was comfortable with me. And so we developed a series of exercises that we could show the jury of what Jake is able to do. So you have to imagine, you know, the, the day for trial comes and the courtroom door is opened up and Jake comes walking into the courtroom. Now, mind you, he is, he's braced, he has an amputee, uh, he's got, he had a paresthesis he comes into the courtroom and the first thing he does, he walks over and um, he falls into me, hugging me. Hi, Tony. You know. Now, we had obviously permission from the judge and defense to bring Jake as a witness. And so I took my coat off at that point and I sat down on the floor with him and we began our routine. Jake didn't know that there were 40, 50 people in the courtroom. He only knew that I was there. And we read to each other. He read to me, I read to him. Um, we rolled a ball to each other back and forth. Um, he told me as, as high as he could his ABCs. Uh, he counted for me. Um, I asked him who his sister was and how old she was. I asked him who his best friend was. And he told me his dad. And I get choked up just thinking about it. That's how I get involved with my clients is, is I don't care what people say. You know, people say you're not supposed to get too personal with your clients. Well, I say bullshit. I do because I am then able to tell their story as if they were there because Jake could not tell his story. Maria Carrion could not tell her story because she was dead. Jake could not tell his story. So it's up to me to tell the story. And I only know one way to tell the story and that's to become them. So a couple more questions before we wrap up. Um, and this one is completely open-ended answer it. However you see fit, what is your view as a trial lawyer? Well, you know, my, my view as a trial lawyer is, is one thing. How do I bridge the gap 
between the horrors that our clients went through and being able to make them whole, right? How, how, how do I bring them justice? So I am, I am that, that, that Gumby of a person that stretches himself from them to the courthouse. How do I get them there? How do I continue to build that bridge in order to get them to the courthouse? How do I get them there through the interview, through the lawsuit, through the written discovery, the oral discovery, their depositions, the experts, the motions in limine, and finally the date of trial. It's, 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 you, be, you are what you are as a trial lawyer, you are an architect. You, you are an architect who then becomes the engineer that builds the bridge to how your client gets there. And if you're able to do that, if you can look at the big picture, and then realize the pieces that are required to build it, you can do it. So last question, admittedly, it is a bit self-serving, but in your opinion, what are the most difficult settlement related issues you face today when resolving personal injury cases? Well, quite frankly, if there is such a thing as the most challenging part are, are the releases that defendants give you. You know, the, the releases don't always look like what they tell you. They will be either in a settlement conference or in a mediation. And then, of course, then you've got kind of like what, what you do, Jason, you know, you, you've got the liens. So you, you've got between, between fighting defense attorneys with the different language that they insert into releases and then having to deal with with either uh, liens or trust or special needs trusts, those are those are the difficult parts of the settlement. You know, those are the parts of the settlement that most lawyers would say I don't want to deal with because I I know I kind of have like an aversion to it a little bit. You know, I don't want to deal with it, but but I know that I have to, and, and so that's sometimes you know, especially if we talk about liens, that's why you know we we call on people like you with in synergy and and helping us because. That's not where my expertise is. My expertise is back where I said it was, building that bridge to get to the courthouse. Yeah, expecting you know a trial lawyer to be, uh, you know, knowledgeable on matters of ERISA and FIBA and Medicare and Medicaid and private health and you know Medicare Advantage. It, it's mm -hmm. that that's that really is. Um, you know, too much, you know, that that's why lawyers don't necessarily handle estate matters or guardianship matters. There are experts that are there to assist with those kinds of issues. And so, you know, that, that to me is the point is that you shouldn't have to deal with the minutia of that because trying to deal with that is, is a full-time job for the people that we employ. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, Tony, um, very much appreciate your time today. If someone would like to work with you and your law firm, what's the best way to reach out to you? Oh, well, that, that's, that would be always an honor. But the best way to reach me is uh, my direct line is 312-253-8600. Our website is rblaw.net. And um, Jason, I, I thank you. It's, it's been a real pleasure. And it's because you ask nice, good questions, easy ones to answer, um, ones, ones that trial lawyers wish we could answer every day. Appreciate that. Well, we'll include Tony's contact information when the episode is posted on the website. And want to thank everyone for tuning into Trial Lawyer Review today. We'll see you on the next episode. Thank you so much, Jason. Thanks for tuning in to Trial Lawyer Review. You can find more at triallawyerview.com and look for more episodes and more content coming in the future.